Well, while a whole lot of incredible things were happening at this cafe, something else was incredibly happening that I didn't know about, which was you <laughs> writing this book. <laughs> that book there. Yeah, uh, so I wrote uh, this book, Peter Nibble and His Fantastic Eyes. Um, I actually lived, uh, I don't even know, maybe it's it's connected, but there's a giant hotel just right around the corner called the Morrow Field. And mm. uh, when I came to graduate school, I, I kind of sight unseen took a really terrible apartment there. Mm. Um, and uh, and so this was the closest coffee shop, and it was sort of the place where I would go when I needed to write. And um, so I think during, I guess it was over the course of about six weeks um, in the summer between my years, I just sat down one day and started writing a book, and yeah. um, and this was sort of the place for me <laughs> to do that. This was a nice refuge away from school, it was away from you know my apartment, and just a place to kind of really concentrate and be warm and drink some tea and <laughs> be warm. Right. Sounds good to me. <laughs> So is it true that you were really playing hooky the entire time you're writing this book? <laughs> I don't know if it, it counts as hooky. Well, certainly not over the summer. But I, this was uh, you're actually uh, right about something because I came here to to write plays and I did the playwriting program at Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. um, and it was during that time that I kind of started wishing I were writing other things. <laughs> and so writing the book was a form of playing hooky because this was far more fun and exciting to me and rewarding than writing plays, which I was terrible at. Um, in all fairness, uh, I probably wasn't I wasn't made of strong enough stuff for that. So, um, but this was kind of again this this place and this book was actually sort of a, a, a this was really the the place where I, I kind of discovered who I was as a storyteller and as a person. And uh, you know, I moved away um, I guess in two thousand five, um, and uh, and my wife and I um, just moved back. We're expecting our first baby, so we just moved to Pittsburgh Ooh, about a month ago. Mazel Tov, and thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, and, and we were really excited to come back to Pittsburgh, and part of it is all the fond memories I have of this town, and mm -hmm. specifically places like um, Tango Cafe, which mm -hmm. have just meant so much to me and fed me in so many ways. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing it here. It must have been a de I guess it wasn't Wednesday night. No, <laughs> no Wednesday nights were a little noisy for uh, me, right? Yeah, but I, that was our fault. <laughs> <laughs> but that actually speaks to one of the things that I really did like about this place, though I could never understand how anyone could tango in such a small space but um, you know uh, this wasn't just a regular coffee shop um, you can go anywhere for decent coffee I worked in a coffee shop actually while I would come here um, but uh, but there was something else going on here um, even though I wasn't part at all or really involved in you know the Spanish speaking community or anything like that um, I'm not a musician but um, I could see all of these different communities coming together, mm -hmm. and they weren't just coming to have coffee, and they weren't just coming to get empanadas, which at the time were delivered in a van. It was very confusing to me. We would like ask for them, and then like 20 minutes later, someone would drive up a car. <laughs> Do you remember this? No, no? I don't okay. know about this. Um, <laughs> I, this is what I remember, at least. Maybe it's a uh, fuzzy. I think they didn't have a kitchen set up yet. Uh -huh. But uh, but even though you know these people weren't coming here just for a drink, they were coming uh, to meet new people and build a community. And uh, and even you know even though I kind of usually stayed well, in that corner over there and didn't talk to anyone, um, I still kind of fed off of that and all the energy and, and, mm -hmm. and the excitement of these people kind of coming together. Mm -hmm. And that was really uh, kind of a wonderful and healthy and and, ex and just good environment to be in. And oh. it was good creatively, but also just as a person, you know, a kid who was far far away from home, who wanted to be near some you know human warmth and joy and laughter. Yeah. So. And how well, how did the idea of Peter Nimble come to you then? Or if you were going to play hooky, why would you write <laughs> a children's book? Well, that's a great question. So um, I'm a big lover of children's books. Um, and uh, in the case of Peter Nimble, Peter Nimble is a story of this 10-year-old uh, blind orphan who's the greatest thief who ever lived. Um, and the whole thing actually started, um, as a lot of the stories I write, start with the picture. Um, I was just kind of sitting one day and I doodled a little drawing of a baby floating in a basket. Um, at, in the ocean, and there, there's a raven perched on the edge that had just pecked out the baby's eyes. Um, and actually, if you, mm. you look on the, in the first chapter of this book, you can see uh, an illustration of it right there. Oh, yeah. Um, Show it to the camera. And sure. And so, that so raven's not Voldemort now. <laughs> the raven is not Voldemort. Um, but uh, so I just kind of I drew that picture and I looked at it. I didn't know who the baby was. I didn't know mm. what he was going to do next. But I wanted to know more. And so, so the picture came first. Exactly. And then drew you into the story. Yeah, and that's for me at least. That's the way it often is. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, from there, just you know, came up with Peter Nimble and his fantastic eyes. And fantastic. It was a fun ride. So. Wow, what's a good age group for this book? Uh, this is appropriate. You know, I wrote it for myself, so mm -hmm. thirty. <laughs> but, 
Uh, but really, it's um, you know. Also, I was specifically writing it sort of uh, to you know. I mean, I guess they're saying about nine to thirteen. Um, for me, uh, I stopped reading when I was about ten years old for whatever reason. And I think part of the reason I wanted to write this book is because it's the book I wished I could go back in time and give myself as a ten year old. Um, I think I, I would have really enjoyed it. I was a weird kid, so I don't know if every ten year old would enjoy it. But it was the book I wished I, could, I think um, they're all weird kids. Yeah, <laughs> the normal kids are the ones you worry about, I suppose. Maybe um, that's true. Yeah. But so that was kind of you know. And it's just been a real joy to, um, again, come back to Pittsburgh right as this book is coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you want to talk about kind of real bookends on a story, kind of starting the book here, mm -hmm. leaving for all these years, and finally coming back just as the book is released and, mm -hmm. and coming back to here. And um, it's just, again, a, a wonderful season of life. I'm really grateful and excited and, and, and very, very thankful for what, for what Tango Cafe was during that little piece of my life. Well, I got to read it just to find out what. How did he get fantastic eyes when he lost his <laughs> eyes go. on the first page? Lots, lots of surprises with him. So, <laughs> right. um, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Fantastic.